Mm -hmm. And uh, he's going to be presenting some version of this ne next week at the CAPS meeting, I think, right? I don't know. No, just skip that. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. What What is the CAPS meeting? CAPS meeting is good. It's just um. So there is a journal called Complexity and Policy, oh. and uh, they have a, they typically have the meet. You know, it's run out of UNC Charlotte, I think. Hmm. Uh, they actually have a um. They actually have an annual meeting in DC, and uh, last year they had it at the University of Maryland, and so I was over there, and and they said they're they're looking for a venue, and so we got them to have it uh, in Arlington on. Wednesday afternoon, Thursday, and Friday morning. So it'd be right. just be two days meetings, and, and everybody from GMU can go free if you want. I don't know. Karen's yeah. supposed to announce. I don't know if she did. She did. Yeah. Okay. So that, that and there's a, there's a good, good good number of papers there, and they're typically mostly aging based model, not all, but but they all have a complexity spin to them. So, but uh, anyways, t take it away, Andrew. Okay, cool. And you're uh, you're live. Okay, thank you. So well, small crowd, so probably do it like more cafe and black. So I don't know if you know what we're talking about, but just a synthesis. I'm basically addressing the history of the video game industry oh. and the hardware part, home console, as a case study of platform uh, markets. And I'll explain further what that does mean. And my particular focus on trying to elaborate my ABM is to uh, test the effect of uh, peer influence and media influence on the generation of blockbusters or the winner that takes it all, supposedly. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so for recent news, uh, platforms have been something that we are all very aware about. So they've been uh, growing in the recent years, they are tanking uh, traditional industries in several sectors um, and they usually have a tendency to control uh, the respective segment. Um, it, it depends on, on different... Would you say, to, to, to maybe put different yes. words on your control over their segment, would you basically say that they have a tendency to, to be monopolies? The, I mean, there, there is a discussion, so the literature always talks about winners takes all and there is a discussion of if they actually are like monopolies or not. Uh, the idea is they are, they are not. They are very sensible to be thrown away, like like uh, an insurgent or a newcomer, new in uh, innovation that disrupt them too. Uh, you can talk, for example, MySpace was disrupted by Facebook and something can but once they are on top, they have this tendency of gaining a lot of control, a lot of market power, uh, raising the barriers for newcomers. So they really need to break it with a, um, a substantially um, more valuable innovation to do that. And just for context, since you, since you, you work in this space more than the rest of us, uh, so would you say that, you know, would it have been the case that you know, back, say, you know, eight or 10 years ago, the fact that the, that the Explorer browser Mm -hmm. Was bundled with Windows operating system. Oh yeah, system. yeah. Is, is is that actually a platform? So that was the discussion. Oh, okay, uh, okay. That so well, it has several impacts the platform organization, and it has for us it has like we were talking recently like with the Facebook and Twitter, it has impacts in social habits and different la uh, labor markets. So and one thing is that. Um, once it, it's under under the scope, like for example, the Microsoft Antitrust case, where they actually were uh, put as a monopoly with the em embedding the browser or embedding a, Mac, a Windows media player. Um, and well, it turns out that this happened around 98 or through the late 90s. And at that point, we, the, uh, academia had some literature, there were people trying to understand this, but we didn't understand it at that point. Uh, it was until 2003, 2004, that, um, I'm gonna skip note that later, that the, the first papers that put an aim on what's happening here, like the two-sided two market, or platform market, uh, were published. So, uh, yeah, and actually, you, you, if you saw the, the, um, well, it's not, not a trial, Customer. but when uh, the Souk well, was in, in, in Congress, uh, we actually don't know, at least the elite powers that were in charge of questioning him didn't know too much about the system uh, in question. 
Now you say when you say we didn't understand it, do you, you mean academically? We uh, would say like a, a, um, besides those who are in charge in, of management of those systems, uh, have other institutions that are no knowledgeable about how it, it operates and how it could ar be articulated into policy or or a bigger ecosystem than just the only managers of this uh, of the platform. You're saying well, they didn't consider or. Um, the regulators didn't consider the negative impacts of having that link together. For example, in the case of the antitrust case, so uh, it, they didn't consider that uh, a platform requires a balance between sides. So they were thinking that because they were charging a below marginal cost to one part, that would be depredatory prices. But they weren't within the price structure of the company that was intentional to get, uh, to get money from the other side that benefited right from the entry of, of those that were charged below minimum cost. So those kind of dynamics were not r really clear over on the table. And um, did they consider how that then impedes innovation in those areas? Oh, that you're, is, you're saying that's an that's issue too. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, because especially, I mean, this comes before, be Microsoft Antitrust isn't the first start. I would say this started back with telecom, uh -huh. uh, with the breakup of AT&T, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then saying, hey, you can also then sell um, other phone services, like service. you can, and you can do exactly other long distance, yes. and it shouldn't be tied together, because without that, you wouldn't have these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that was really stifling innovation. Once you started breaking those pieces up and say, and let people then choose different components, you then get innovation in areas you never yeah. dreamed of. Yeah, the, the, so platform has several definitions, um, so the different levels basically. It has a definition that there are different levels. You can talk about a company that's a platform or a service that's a platform, but usually we talk about technology as a platform, and you could say, for example, uh, the line, line phones, like, how do you call it? Landlines. Landlines. That, yeah, Those, that, that's, a, uh, that's a platform. And actually operates by the, the, the same principle of having yeah. two different entities that connect thanks to the platform. Um, uh, those type of technologies or formats, even the format world between DHS and Betamax, there are, are usually cases <coughs> where you see the, the, the winner takes all phenomena. Like once a format is against sufficient critical mass, then it, it owns the, so that's why the, the case with the uh, telephone companies was a bit very tricky because granting like complete, a complete, um, a, a completely availability supply of that technology could lead them to, if they don't separate it. But maybe just mm -hmm. to clarify though, I mean, the, the, these are similar but different cases. I mean, yes. it, it, it yes. is the case, right, that when Microsoft uh, when, when these when it, its behavior was brought up both to the Europeans and the, the American yeah. uh, Department of Justice, I mean there was antitrust law that could be invoked, like from the telecom era and from before. Yeah, antitrust law that could be used to, in essence, find a remedy. Yeah, but I think in the Facebook cases, it's, it's not obvious, right? Yeah, it's, what, it's what, what the legal. Yeah, remedy and is. in that case, I mean, my my thoughts is is more um, relevant to how they manage information and the transparency on algorithms and how we will propose a way of not decentralized, but keep a sustainable ecosystem of how we handle information rather than just having one centralized uh, uh, company that or firm organization that can get uh, control over it and preventing them to having like the idea of erasing information just before it could lead to black markets of information, like people going extra mile to like harvest farm data mm -hmm. and then selling it all, all ways. So I know it's tricky. I mean, I'm just pr saying that it's a, a complicated <laughs> issue. Uh, so I'm going to a little bit of more fun side that we're, uh, I'm gonna talk about the entertainment industry and how the platforms uh, have affected. Um, so entertainment has always shown high volatility. So there's a, a great book from uh, Arthur Devani on Hollywood economics and he tries to address the volatility of like a movie that actually makes it like as a, a blockbuster. And platforms 
can only add more more variability to to the dish. Um, okay, so let's get in more into a topic. So this is a brief uh, intro to the platform literature. So those two papers on top are the ones that started um, this discipline, as it were. Uh, the basic definition would be any market where an intermediary enables the interaction between two or more distinct sites, and usually that uh, it enables it by reducing their transaction cost in terms of security or speed um, or the quality of the match. Uh, the focal top, uh, topics of study are usually are the launching problem, the chicken and egg, which side should I include first within the platform, uh, the price structure on maintaining uh, respective prices for all sites, and the issue of the winner takes all or most. Oh, uh, and well, the video in industry is mentioned in one of the classic paper the from the Tirol as one a natural platform or two-sided market. Um, okay, so let's talk about the video game industry. It has historically been dominated by a few competitors, um, like brands like Nintendo, Microsoft, the Sony PlayStation. Um, it's innovation driven, the same thing that we were talking before. It, it is not also, also driven by technology, it also needs uh, not new narrative designs or new content, a lot of art, if you may say, if you'd like to consider games as art. Um, and with high uncertainty on new goods market performance. And that's basically because of the nature of the goods that are experienced goods, uh, which by definition are, are goods that you can only evaluate once you consume them or you already obtain them. You, you can't evaluate the the utility you're gonna get from a movie until you already saw it. So there is a risk on assessing that and there is a lot of we trust uh, on critics views, on peer reviews, uh, to get a proxy of, uh, of that value. Um, okay, so that's uh, like a small <laughs> snapshot oh, sorry. Uh, uh, on the big, uh, home console industry. So since I'm, I'm gonna talk about home console industry and basically on hardware, the one that you put in the living room. Um, so the whole history before this, we had the arcades and then uh, PC was all the way through starting around the, the late 70s. Uh, today we have like a digital revolution with mobile. Uh, basically PC is, is getting ahead. So basically, every, everyone, every line is there's a time series for one console. Yeah, right? those are. But but several of them are going to be from the same manufacturer. Yeah. Right? Just different different generations. I think the next one shows, just to give an idea of who controls what, uh, those are the five more important, and the purple one is other uh, companies. So it's the same five that go through the forty years. You said you were or were not including PC type games here. Yeah. No. Okay. I will not. Yeah. Are there are the four? Are, are they actually all, are they really Japanese uh, companies? I mean, is it Atari, Atari Japanese? Or is uh, no, Atari is American. Yeah. Okay. How about Sega? Sega is Japanese. Yeah. Okay. And Atari is basically dead. I mean, it exists yeah. as a studio. Um, both of them make games now. Yeah, both of them. Game, yeah. yeah, and Sega profits from. But uh, doing games for making games for Nintendo, mm -hmm. basically. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And this is just another like picture to get an idea of how uh, games are distributed among among one of the sites that's software developers. Uh, I will talk about developers and publishers under like the same category, although they are not. Um, this is actually de uh, developers, so studios that make games. Hmm? Chris, are we going to ask the same question? Probably, go ahead. 
Uh, just curious, did you pull it out on a log log plug? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 I, I, yeah. Uh, I don't have it here, but I plug in a log. Uh, it has. Um, is it a straight line on a log log? Yeah, I mean, visually, it's so cool. It's like it fits. Uh, it has an alpha of two point something, and uh, I run several tests like the. Grow smear or something like that. The KS, uh, the KS, and it says it's um, doesn't doesn't statistically significant. It'd be useful to show though, just because we don't we don't care if it's it's kind of metaphysics yeah. whether it's a power law or not. But to just whenever you have a graph that's mostly white space like this one is, it's just not yeah. very revealing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also too, what if um so in this in this in this plot every game is just counts one unit, right? So whether it's sold a, a, yeah. a million dollars worth or ten million dollars worth, it's still just one, that's one game, right? I didn't plot that one because that's more space, yeah, more, right, white, more white space, space. Because the the curve, like, yeah, it has a bigger head. And more extreme. Yeah, extreme. So it would be useful. One of you, yeah, it'd be nice on here to show, to show those two plots in lo in uh, some kind of you know, log coordinate system, and yeah. then show how the how they're different. Like yeah. The dollar value versus the count. So. Oh, this is like a small example of what what happened. So. This is a game that re released with uh, just tens of thousand units sold. Uh, today you can buy like a completing box for three thousand uh, dollars, and it's considered like a great game. It's a, like a hidden jewel within the community. What does it run on? Uh, it uh, in <laughs> the Nintendo Entertainment System. They actually okay. ported to America, but it was more famous in in Japan, like in the Famicom. Uh, and so this is just one, one uh, an example, an idea of why what went wrong for that game. So at the same time, Mortal Kombat was releasing with 2.7 million units sold. Uh, they were already on the next generation of platforms. Uh, so for starters, didn't go for the, the right platform. And even though the, for example, Mega Man 5 on the counterpart was in the same platform, uh, it did it better uh, because they were just responding to a console, console uh, IP. So there is a there is a brand value, and there is also like a, a structural value on how what you need to consider to uh, put your games. And what, explain more to me about yeah. like consolidated IP. Oh, uh, so you can see it's the fifth title of the Mega Man series. Ah, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, IP is intellectual property, or it's basically brands for consumers or the um, ti titles of, uh, so you have several stuff. So for example, Capcom already is a, is a seal of, uh, of quality. If, you, if you're a gamer that you've already seen that the publisher has released several good games. Um, it, usually they don't make five games of the same saga. I mean, that, the Mega Man was a very successful saga, so they tried to squeeze everything. Is that still around? Is Mega Man still around? Uh, yeah, they, I yeah, actually yeah. trying to. They are trying to. Capcom is really weird, mm -hmm. so I really don't understand many of Japanese companies. Okay. <laughs> uh, but what they are doing now is they are reselling these games mm -hmm. in bundles. Uh, you cannot buy them, and they're they're releasing in a couple of months. For the new platforms, they're releasing the same games, and um, they are doing at last the Mega Man 11, but they took a lot of time. So, a uh, summary of the, the idea here. And so that quote for me like represents a lot of the what we see here. The Yama, uh, Hiroshi Yamauchi was the owner and uh, CEO of Nintendo on the like golden days. He was in charge of doing the Nintendo Entertainment System, the Super Nintendo 64 and, and so forth. Uh, he said if the DS, that's a portable uh, console they were doing, uh, succeeds, they will rise to heaven, but if it fails, they will sink to hell. And there you can see, although very blurry, that those are the profit margins for the top uh, video game publishers. You can see that already from the eighth or so, uh, you could see like red numbers. So it's very risky for um, firms involved. And, and what I, what I want to do is to understand the mechanism that in, uh, influence the emergence of these blockbusters within the, the platform market.
um, the relevance is the is the um, the growth of global market and the need to address management strategies like the price structure or understanding diffusion or how people adopt uh, new products within the the platforms product being understood like anything like an even an idea um, uh, well, the lack of uh, social and economic history of the video game industry is basically anecdotal. Yes. Uh, do uh, console companies uh, subsidize uh, for developers? Maybe these numbers do not reflect, you know, a financial incentive for them to develop for uh, a specific console. So the prices would be, uh -huh. you know, on the market low, but the company would have, you know, covered some cost of, of some kind. Do, uh, have you ever heard of uh, such a deal? Uh, like, I get the idea about subsidized, like, like uh, get subsidized? So yeah, you know, uh, Sony going to uh, some develop, uh, developer and saying, uh -huh. you know, uh, develop for us. And oh, they, they do. They, they totally, I mean, usually the, the, the publisher, so those, those are, the, those firms are there seen as publishers, not as um, platform oh. managers. Okay. So usually the publisher is the bank for developers. So they they will give you the money. They will like take charge of you. They will do your marketing stuff and everything. They will deal with licenses to the platform. You as the developer, you just produce the game like a keep a a, a face value. Um, but the platform itself doesn't uh, give money to. The, there is a um, th there might be another thing though with, with this particular plot is that uh, video game publishing and the, the cycle is actually longer than the 12 month cycle yeah 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 so um, you may take a loss in you know the fiscal 07 yes uh, but then because the game is going to be released at the end of you know fiscal 09 totally, so totally. That, that and usually they go with the tenfold strategy yeah. and on movies like you have yeah. one one sure thing or you try to have like right. a sure thing that could um, ameliorate the damage of other losses well and, and then but, but now also they're, they're working more towards releasing a main title and then having a lot of dlcs the downloadable content oh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. small if, like if we're gonna talk variations about and stuff so it, it it's worth it to take yeah. a loss one year yes. and then because you're all you want to do is increase the capacity of, of who's who's playing the game yeah. to develop lots and lots of follow-up series yeah. to it so that that may be i don't know if they were doing that back then though 10 years ago so yeah probably not no i mean there's been a lot of discussion that like uh, for example a game shouldn't cost 60 dollars should cost like 80. i mean the like the consumers are expecting 60 dollar value um, they are very afraid of increasing so they are usually charging for dlcs or whatever yeah. um, Back to that, yeah. that slide, though, yeah. you know, so I remember at one time uh, hearing when Art Devaney, hearing Art Devaney talk about movies, yeah. the question was that he, he was typically, he would do profit and loss on the basis of, uh, of individual movies, not studios. Right? Yeah. Right. And the question arose that, you know, isn't it the case that a studio can basically, um, you know, by having many movies, they in essence, they have a kind of a risk strategy, right, where some of yeah, the risks of it. Yeah. Now, for Devaney, his whole thing was that um, the movie business is so risky in the first place, that it's very hard to use conventional risk measures. It's very hard for a film, a studio to pool ahead of portfolio of movies because every movie is very risky. Yeah. And so his argument was, in essence, was that he he, he liked to have it. He liked to dis disaggregate down to the individual, uh, in essence, investment vehicle, which which was always one movie. Yes. And then, and then, there were, then he had Titanic. He made made five billion dollars. Ever was it? But most movies lose money. So. In this case, you're actually kind of this is kind of more the, the version of being at the studio level. Now, my, so my studio, question is: yeah. Is it the case though that for them, like if you unpack that Nintendo box, there is it the case that like you know two or three titles dominate the whole thing, uh, or, or not? So I think so far Nintendo has it under control. I mean, I wouldn't include Nintendo. It's a very very <coughs> weird case where they have several IPs, um, they know the community like consistent. Mm -hmm response from that community so they know they'll say they must uh, sell like uh, 500,000 units of uh, Monster Hunter so there's a, like a lot of persistence in the demand yeah so they know they, they some niches and some like strong titles that they're gonna sell like Mario Kart 
Like, mm -hmm. it's super weird how everybody loves Mario Kart and everybody buys Mario Kart, and usually they just release it again. Like, even if the game ha doesn't have any changes, <laughs> what happened between the Wii U and the, the last two platforms, they released basically the same software and it was, it's, it sells. Okay, so Wasn't that kind of similar to when a, a movie comes out, and yeah. then you have the DVD version of the movie, the theatrical yeah. release, mm -hmm. then you have the one with the with the ones that have the scenes that were cut out, but now yeah. they've included it. And now you've got the one that's got with the director's comments. Mm -hmm. And so they just have a, a, a series of releases of, of, DVD, yeah. of movies that say DVD, Blu-ray, um, that uh, all are just incrementally better. And, and people will buy those if you, they yeah. really like that particular that the particular movie. Yeah. They, they usually, did they usually do, do that before? Before it was like the this, this simple structure of if they like the first one, let's make a second one, mm -hmm. right? But now they are doing this like remastered version or HD. If you like the one you played on like 1990, now you have like the HD version of that. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the same that thing of adding really small stuff to capitalize on the community that loves the game or movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so to go ahead and hopefully get into the model. So this is, um, just a brief idea of how the platform works. So as we already discussed, that there's a platform that reduces transaction costs between two sides. Um, so what's relevant here? Um, so I guess we, we've discussed this like in some way. So in the specifics of how the, the video game um, industry works as a platform, we have that the platform will sell um, I mean, it doesn't sell. Gets a license with the publisher and developer uh, be, uh, below marginal cost. Uh, oh, so that's that's backwards. Uh, the below marginal cost is the access for the consumer. So usually they sell uh, a, a console at marginal cost or below uh, the actual hardware to get people uh, into the platform, and then they capitalize on on the sales of games with the publisher. Uh, developer. <coughs> Can I read? So, yeah, I'm gonna skip a little bit. Just, just a brief intro. Like it's a growing industry. It's basically the entertainment uh, industry of the early twenty-first uh, century. Um, it's still growing uh, and it's getting more diverse. And so the main actors are manufacturers, uh, the publishers, manufacturers basically the platform manager, publishers, developers. Um, so I, I consider the retailer or the distribution of, of products a really important part. I don't include it in my model, but for what I've read in history, like especially in the early 90s, uh, issues with distribution could be really important. Um, today is almost irrelevant as it becomes digital, yeah. Um, so how would you classify some place like Steam? Would that be a retailer? They're they're completely online. There's, it's all yeah. That's digital. that's they are like everything. So oh. they, they 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 are the platform and the, the distribution directly. Right, but they're not the necessarily the, the the manufacturer of the game because they no, have other no, people's games no. that they provide in their platform. Right. So yeah, that they actually. They actually run a platform in the sense that connect you with the right. guy that made the, the, the game. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so there are several sectors like arcade PC and, and the model will be dedicated just to home console. Um, but th this is more about how the, the industry is growing, getting heterogeneous. And one particular thing that I can mention later about the difference between Japan and North, North, like basically the rest of the world is is very clear, and it's really important in the sense that they have taken not taking control, but they have been the major actor in the industry since Atari lost its relevance. Um, yeah, I'm gonna skip the history. So one thing it's important to address, like the winner takes all, and who's controlling what is defining uh, the competitions. 
Uh, usually that that is uh, done by having a class called the generations. Um, so platforms that have similar technology are considered within the same the same generation. Uh, for example, uh, during the seventies, you had the punks. All the punks were basically the same technology. So that's uh, one generation. Then Atari Twenty Six Hundred allowed actually to have a console that was a platform where third parties could manufacture games. So that's the first console platform, like by definition. Uh, there were several similar games, so um, there are different ways of doing it. I'm following Kemmerer, that he already proposed a study on how uh, we can do this. And following those uh, generations, I do my studies of how the competition uh, came to be. So here we have the major platforms, the total units of those platforms among the different you can can see very well, but uh, never mind the first one. It's not included. It starts with the second one, and then you can go this L, L shape where the usually usually there is one that takes a lead. Um, so in the specific case of video games, you can say that there is no winner takes all. There is a winner takes most, um, and in some cases, like in the seventh generation. It, it wasn't that clear. Although you always have to remember we're not considering PC and um, portable. That's really important. So well the winner takes most. Um, so I try to do like a, a serial collation of game market share by um, publishers. So that's the rank on separated by ten bins. I, uh, in rank order of what the uh, the unit sales they had for each year, and then I try to have like how likely is that someone that is on top keeps on, stays uh, selling more, or how likely is that someone that uh, did a bad stays there. Um, so there you can see uh, that the first two two decils uh, have a tendency to stay on top with a standard deviation that doesn't even go below uh, the zero. That's oh. for 2007? Oh, no, that's uh, between uh, 1990 and 2010. I think there would be a difference when you factor in online gaming because yeah. uh, networking basically. Yes, Go yeah, ahead. it's a whole new world, yeah, I do agree. There yeah. are different patterns if you split the data before yeah. online, and then yes, um, yeah, there, there is there is a so I see in the data that there is a weird stuff coming from late um, uh, after 2008 with mobile and the rise of the indies. Uh, it gets really different, so that's why I'm interested in, in getting to PC like Steam and the other competing platforms. Um, because here, one, one of the issues with my data is that the games that don't sell well, you basically don't have data. It's like they publish, and we don't know anything else. Well, we know that the game existed, but uh, keeping track of the sales is, is difficult. They Although don't, still, uh, yeah, they don't have tell them. you their sales when they are too low, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess go back. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh sorry, you missed so this one. This is it's, it's 160 million units. Uh, that was a, that's a huge number. Yeah, uh, that's a. Uh, so remember, I, I included he here. I included portable. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a fun fact. Remember that Hiroshi Yamauchi, the CEO, said if it if it works, we can. Yeah. The orange one that goes over the top. That's the DS. Mm -hmm. That's the one they were, mm -hmm. so yeah, they did it. So one thing is, well, I'm gonna start talking about diffusion of innovation, relevance of diffusion within platforms. Um, so this is this is how they've been adopted, the cur the adoption curves. Uh, one interesting thing is the speed of adoption. So you, I guess you've seen the plot of adoption of technologies in general is getting faster. Well not going beyond just the home console market, you can see that platforms are selling faster than before. 
So that leaves a, a smaller window of time of <coughs> making, yeah. Rates of adoptions are faster, but are rates of switching faster through? De-adoption. De-adoption? Yeah, and so in this particular sector, I, 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 wouldn't, I, I wouldn't think so, but in ours, mm -hmm. yeah, especially uh, when we're talking about uh, low cost of entry, the, the issue with um, home consoles is that they're relatively expensive, right? 400, when they are new, it's 500, so you can buy a PC or something, so it's not really massive in that sense, and it really restrains your possibilities, uh, <coughs> uh, I think, of moving to a multi homing what it's called, mm. like being multi multiple or switching platforms. Um, being that, I think this, the number is 1.4 consoles per person. Okay. We could say that every, every, every three, you have, no, every one point, every, I'm missing the numbers. Every three people you have to <laughs> You have to consult, yeah, yeah. Well, it all looks like they're averaging out for most of them. So like as you go mm -hmm. past 2015, I mean, with more data, if they're all averaging out, it, it kind of makes, it, I don't think de-adoption's happening, but they're hanging on to that number. So they might not be selling Oh, anymore. but this, this is just sales, because you actually can track when someone like left their console uh, mm -hmm. and somewhere and, and is playing the other one. This is just basically like a proxy of what they are playing. Right, so yeah. they're not basically giving it up because it's not dipping. So they're not leaving, you know, it's oh not no, dipping down, but it's um, stabilizing it. It's this community. Yeah. Oh, community. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. Well. Are the data for, are the data for kind of where it dips, would, would the data be as good as the, for the adoption or, or not? I mean, could you also make a similar plot for the for for, for, for when people quit using the platform? Quit yep. I mean, I have the disaggregated. I mean, the, this one. Uh, I have more okay. fine data on the last ten years with monthly uh, sales. So that could be like a better approach mm -hmm. than just yearly. Yearly is too aggregated. Um, Okay. Yeah. So, quick run on uh, the vision of innovation. Um, so, the basic discipline uh, considers uncertainty as a, as an, an, an issue to address on how any innovation is gonna uh, spread through a system. Uh, so, in in that sense, um, I mean, in that and many other sense, it's a proper framework to try to uh, understand how people will finally adopt or not adopt um, specific products. Um, okay, so one, one important thing that is part of the model is that considering that information of quality is uncertain based on the experience goods, consum consumers need to trust and evaluate information from mixed sources such as opinion leaders, peers, and mass media. Um, this is the literature where it comes to the experience goods, so they separate it between three types of goods, and we are talking about the post-purchase evaluation goods, um, and there's a list of in inherent risks within the experience goods. For the consumer, you have like the, the hardware, the machine design and performance, or the game separated can be uh, not what you're expected, or even the combination of those, the compatibility. Um, maybe some hardwares are not as good to play some certain games, like for example FPS, like shooting games are maybe more enjoyable in PC than um, a console, or something like that. But I'm gonna try to speed a little bit. Uh, well, I, I normalize the adoption curves of platforms uh, don't have here the table, but they all feed into the traditional uh, sinusoidal curve um, and have respective P and Q values for the bus model, traditional bus model. But in as CSS guys, we are trying to disaggregate and look at behaviors rather than just having a um, function that explains it. So, or maybe, maybe different to say this, we go back to the bus model and yeah. basically 
best model assumes the whole thing is well mixed, or it assumes, and it assumes that everybody's the same. Yeah, yeah. So it makes a whole bunch of assumptions that we don't want to make. Yeah, and, avoid them. and I, yeah, I didn't want to go too in depth with this here, but here the, the P and Q are basically are, um, representing external and internal influences. So I actually don't remember who, what's to what. I'm sorry about that, but um, so one depends on how, how they basically it has some precepts of like economic theory in the sense that the assumption is that everybody knows everything. I mean, ev ev everybody knows what other people uh, adopted or not. So there is complete information, and and there is a a rate of um, moving forward the the uh, adoption probability of taking something that that just that's external input. The internal input is from any other thing or other object. So it's very simplified in those in those terms. Um, and uh, I'm having uh, the model is some of a mix between a small world and a preferential attachment network. It's one over the other. It's really weird, but. Uh, what are the nodes yeah. there? Just out of curiosity. So oh, that's um, uh, licenses. Oh, okay. Between um, publishers on respective platforms. So is the, there's yeah. I'll start. Is it one of those things like with um, I don't know certain technologies the payoff is is greater if like let's say someone else has the same console so yeah. you can share games across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a the reference as the indirect and direct network effects. So uh, direct network effects is if you have it I, and I have it, then we are benefiting. And indirect is when we, for di different, for example, between the developer and the consumer, there are indirect network effects in the sense that if there are more consumers, then it is more likely for me to succeed selling my game. And those are indirect network effects that are a fundamental part of how a platform works. And just real quick, just to follow up on Rob's question. So mm -hmm. the nodes are the nodes are what again? And publishers. the edges are what? Publishers. The nodes are publishers? Yes. Okay. And the edges if they're developing for that particular Yeah, one. that's a license, right? Like uh, we are working for you. That's so, so so take a company like Electronic Arts or some company that develops for many different platforms. Electronic Arts would appears just once in the graph, and then it has links to many different, many different, has many different licenses. Uh, yeah, it should be. I mean, and so basically, so I'm just saying, when you have a cluster like that, mm -hmm. or a cluster that those are going to be companies that develop exclusively for that one platform or for, for that. Yeah, one, yeah, those are exclusives. So this is a bipartite now. So there are two types of nodes in here. There is the developer and there is yes. the publisher. Yeah. And um, basically, yeah, the the publishers are not labeled. To don't make it, make make it as messy. So do you just have those with labels or the platforms? Okay. So so this would actually uh, I don't know maybe you'll go through more uh -huh. uh, analysis, but this would be really amenable to uh, looking at centralities and then the microstructures themselves, like you know running a, an ergam or something, because mm -hmm. it seems like the network is small enough to where we could you could run a statistical model on it. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> but it'd be interesting for me to to see like. For example, if there's a lot of triads, like if some publishers uh, like to develop <coughs> for two specific mm -hmm. uh, platforms and then that's it, yeah, maybe yeah. a triad there of some kind. So there'd be a lot of shapes in there, microstructures that yeah, would be really interesting. Yeah, that would be interesting. interesting. The, the other interesting thing is this is a uh, dynamic network, basically because I have dates for uh, licenses. Mm -hmm. So you could, you could see how it, it evolves through time. Yeah. And even you can you can also know uh, the result of that relationship. Yeah. Did they sell or n did they not? So you can um, run a stochastic actor model. Yeah, you can see how likely it is to have another license based on your performance through time. Um, but yeah, that's that's super cool. There is a, there is a paper that tries to, I mean did something with this. Uh, the uh, professor is here in university wow. uh, with uh, just one iteration, like a window of time between like. 98 and 2003, something like that, and they and they went like step by step, looking at ha what happened when some uh, publisher released to one platform, how likely they would be to release the same release the same game to another platform, how much time would they, they take. Uh, this is the guy at the business school. Yeah. 
Okay, so the, the model. So the, my purpose is to reproduce the general behavior of the, the, this platform life cycles and I experiment the scenarios to understand the formation of the linear console and blockbusters. Um, okay, so basic is that uh, this basic information asymmetry and the consumers and developers will attempt to adopt the most satisfying platform available in the market for them. Um, they both uh, both sides evaluate the other side to to make a decision. Um, <coughs> oh yeah, so some important things is like, for example, no new firms enter the market and existing agents cannot leave. So there is it's very static in that sense. Um, I think we missed a line there. Clue is very sensitive. Oh yeah, and a firm doesn't go bankrupt, they just cease to, to produce. Um, but let's get an idea of what's happening here. So we have the manufacturers or platform managers. They will provide a specific platform for which a developer and a consumer can decide to adopt or not. So the developer will have a license uh, with a specific uh, time development uh, window where they uh, seal the deal and then they start developing. Um, manufacturers and developers can promote their products to consumers. And consumers will evaluate the platform based on the amount of games and the amount of developers and other consumers that are within the platform or not. So social evaluation is important. Um, here, uh, well, basically, manufacturer will have a relationship with uh, uh, platforms and certain developers, consumers, amount of games and unit sales. Beyond that, they have uh, limited. So, for the results I'm gonna show you, we are just talking about um, there is no uh, multi homing here. So, developers can only produce for can only decide to produce for one platform. So that I will change in. in my next steps, like allowing uh, multi-homing. Uh, for now, it's, it's uh, just that. And they also have a marketing uh, operation or like promotion operation where they take a um, certain amount of the random population and they try to positively influence towards the platform. Um, developers are, are really basic. Uh, well, let's go just to the properties first. So they have uh, that, uh, consumer is also important. They have preferences uh, and a set of expectations too. Expectations basically what they think the value of the, or the utility of the, um, of the product would be. Um, once they experience the product, they, they do um, like a, 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 a dot product with the vector between their preferences and the properties or features of the product, and then they will get their utility from that result. Um, okay, yeah, this is the main behaviors. So manufacturer doesn't do too much. It just a uh, uh, fixed uh, date for release. They offer the platform in that moment, allowing developers to have uh, licenses. They start promoting. And to see what happens. So right now, they are really basic. Developers too are very basic, they are very reactive. So they have a platform evaluation, but the platform evaluation is basically be, um, seeing other, the consumers, a uh, limited amount of consumers, um, and knowing their, their preferences, what they are going to buy, or if they already adopted the, the platform. Uh, in the case of, of consumers, that's the most um, elaborate part so far. So the main behaviors would be the social interaction uh, <coughs> based uh, in the influence that they get from that interaction is based on on this equation where the my expectation of a certain product on T plus one is the same as the one I have plus the average of my neighbors, like very simple uh, opinion dynamic process. 
and this is just testing around what happens when just consumers interact with each other in different topologies here you have like a 2d layout and that's a 3d layout when they start transmitting information and, and checking out what other people want and then allowing one of them to consume and then spread the network so yeah let's go to daily results Oh, this is quality. Well, it's quality similarity uh, between the platform cycles that I, I showed you before and the ones in the simulation, um, uh, specifically on the adoption curves and the long tail uh, unit sales of games. Um, and you can see it's time, time dependent the evolution of platform competition shows that there are disruptive effects of the technology innovation when a new uh, platform comes in. Um, Actually, the both uh, adoption sites, uh, the adoption of both sites tend to correlate, as expected. Uh, the advantage on developer participation may lock the platform uh, because of the development time, and that also, I mean, that's an intuition of what happens in the market. Uh, it applies, it appears in the in the model results. Um, well, we have. So here are some um, this is just a simulation run. This is not aggregated of many simulations. This is just one with 100 competitors, 100 uh, th thousand consumers and two generations. They are both releasing uh, both platforms release at the same time. They compete and then they, they release again. You have the cumulative adoption curves basically there. Um, the expectations, uh, how they uh, basically how they perceive the products, and uh, the, they always start at zero. So nobody like is the simulation starts like as nobody knows anything about the industry. Um, maybe that's a thing that I need to change a little bit. Um, and the amount of uh, developers per platform and how they actually do it with their games. Say a little more on respect to the previous slide. So yeah. say a little bit more how how uh, how does the, the how does the manufacturer actually decide the timing of of its of its new platform? I mean, it picks a random no, that's number. Fixed. Oh, By me, it's fixed. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, exogenous. Um, the rationale of picking that may be too complex. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, this is with um, three platforms. But just, just that's just to give you an idea of what the model does. So well, my target parameters in general, uh, the cumulative adoption in average. So when I, in, in average, basically what I mean here is mostly more than average is the cumulative adoption of a typical um, platform. So I usually try to look at as a one run and see a pair platform how it, in, it goes. Uh, median usually it's a better representative because sometimes there are too clear like the winners uh, and they have the um, the typical sinusoidal curve and there are some other competitors that have a weird shape uh, that tends to like mess with an with the average as you can see there um, so you can see here for example the mess uh, it's a little bit messy but if you compare the median of the empirical data. So the red one usually, th this is the empirical data. So if you compare the medians, it, it fits a, a, a lot better with the simulation results. Um, you, know to, you know to calibrate the model to kind of wall time or to, to real time? I mean, so how do, how do you step the model? So um, monthly or something or weekly or? So I basically normalized it, I bin it in one, so I have a thing to, I. I take my, my simulation, the simulation usually takes uh, three and 350 steps, one step being a week. A week, okay. Right, then I aggregate in bins and I compare it with okay, the, the steps. steps uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, platform ranks are basically the amount of um, games that each platform has. Uh, the developer total unit sales, uh, same as before. So um, basically, the results I want to present today is a sensitivity analysis of uh, peer influence 
and the mass media influence on the whole system. So here you have, um, so the, the, the value here that changes, it's um, coefficient to the, um, to the, to this equation, to change the effect on uh, the size of the neighbor's um, value, right? The average of the, so if I keep it like as it is, it's one, um, point one is just 10% of that value to ameliorate uh, the amount of influence the neighbors will have, right? And in promotion is the size of uh, the, the random pool the marketing operation takes from the consumer population. So 5% is just 5% of the population and 20, 20%. So what you, you can see is the changes in, in, in adoption curve. <coughs> Uh, they they both contribute in in, in different in different ways, um, so you you can see that if peer influence is low, uh, media won't matter at all. Like mass media doesn't affect, but if it is high, uh, then it can accelerate uh, the adoption like uh, a lot. Um, Making it making it really unreasonable on um, on the case of, for example, the twenty percent with complete social influence, it is way beyond. Uh, it's too fast regarding the the data, the historical data. Okay, when we have two platforms, here you have uh, same same contrast. It, it gets, uh, the mind that this is average. So it didn't deal with, with me, uh, medium uh, distributions or cumulative curves. Um, yeah, red is what? And, and red is, so the one that's usually the same, red, that's empirical data of like the opposite <coughs> of the one that we saw with the diffusion of analysis with the okay. bus, bus yeah. curve, that one. So the red is the target, basically. Yeah. How did you come up with your ends? Ends of Like, in terms of uh, consumers, like how did you determine what was the right oh, yeah, yeah. number for so that? So there are some companies that have, some, so these numbers are not, um, these are running with 2,000 consumers. Right. And uh, 100 developers, so those ratios are not calibrated yet. Yeah, not at all. I mean, there are some estimates of the population of consumers, but I'm having uh, issues with estimating on previous times because they have for like after 2005 or something like that. Like they keep track and they have, they have. There's a whole firm that, uh, as a cons consultant firm, that has the information probably sells it. But beyond, I mean, before that, it's like, I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I really, I don't know how to do that because probably it's as, as they can multi-home, it's not like the total of the platforms there, etc. So, yeah. And that's when you include a, a third platform, it's not, that different from having uh, an option. So when you are at an option, uh, yeah, usually you have these weird um, values because the the behavior of one platform is really different from the other. Um, so here's another result on developers by platform. Um, so usually there is not a lot of stochasticity uh, within the model. So with the same initial uh, parameters and conditions, uh, uh, it, it's, it keeps the same behavior. In this case, we have, this is, this is a, um, aggregator of uh, 30 simulations each. And you can see that I here intentionally, I put one uh, platform release uh, one week before the other. Uh, and the one that comes before always has an advantage. Uh, that's basically, uh, because this set of uh, developers that, that hop into the platform right away is 
do it in, in that time of window, right? In that moment, they go there, and they go there based on the proportional amount of consumers that are like the innovators that are willing to, to buy this uh, platform. And that's why you have that set of developers that stay there until release, and then it gains more traction. Yep. So and, and here you can really see how m more influence in any way uh, makes the one that has a little bit of advantage to gain a lot of advantage in the short term. Although in the long term, it seems that uh, it still gains sufficient traction. Uh, this is more complicated one with three platforms. There's still the advantage of the, the first one. The third one usually also dies off. Uh, the interesting here, the interesting thing here is the second one that uh, may compete with the um, with the one that had the advantage. As you can see, the green one is the second one, and in some conditions, it can keep um, a competitive moment. The the other relevant thing. Uh, is that this is a full connected network and uh, for what I've read so far uh, it's important to separate North America from Japan I mean I'm, I'm gonna yeah future work I'm gonna show you right now so those are the results but I'm gonna comment a little bit on the Japanese thing here you have uh, sales for games you can see that um, I don't know exactly the year but from half uh, before, before the twenty fourth year of the history of that I have, all the prices are the same. I mean, not the prices; the unit sales are the same for each game. That's basically because they don't have the data, so any data goes for everybody. Uh, but after that, they can separate games from for re region. And oh, I'm sorry, but um, Japan. It's this green line right here. So uh, I didn't put the, the other uh, figure, but the other figure is the amount of games sold by uh, uh, region. Uh, Japan goes like around here. So I'm not sure if the database I have is strongly ba uh, biased towards North America. And there is a lot of uh, games that were sold in Japan and we don't know or they make a lot of games and they don't sell <laughs> sell them that doesn't seem to be right but nevertheless uh, platforms like the DS that the one I showed you before the portable thing that's uh, like a huge hit in in Japan like everybody has it and keeps it, it, it keeps sustainable uh, it keeps Nintendo sustainable and then Nintendo can sell stuff here and that we also have Sony PlayStation, the same thing, uh, and they are separated ecosystems. So what we see here, uh, the these like fierce competitions between uh, the developers that decide that it's better to go here or whatnot. It could be interesting to have two s two pools, two set uh, of consumers where some developers can go on and profit from one like community opinion or preferences uh, and others do uh, different stuff on the others that that actually what happens in, in the difference between uh, North America Europe on and Japan where the the games are have really different styles and different communities so those are the results I, I wanted to present today and <coughs> I think we're fine in the time but um, working on getting on multi-home. So multi-home is a, a phenomenon that is growing here. You can s see blue bar is the exclusive games per, per platform, and the red bar are, are the games that are multi-home. That means that they are in different platforms. Um, below there, you can see the, the generations, but it's really small. The thing is that multi-homing is growing for consumers and developers at the same time. So uh, for as we were talking before, like the videos you're changing, maybe for platforms like as expensive as these pieces of hardware that are competing with PC, uh, the consumer doesn't have that much options to move around. 
but developers with the middleware that we have now, like technologies like Unity, they are just like porting with a quick when the game is simple enough. So that allows for the publisher to have a stronger um, negotiation power against uh, platforms. The other thing that's important is seasonality. So it seems that everybody is strongly affected by uh, Christmas or December or whatnot. Uh, that's the moment to buy games, it seems. But the sales of games in those particular months between November and December, like Skywalker. And having the nature that we were discussing about people influencing each other, that's a, a limited window where you you're pressured to buy the game in some somehow with the limited information that you have, uh, making it possible that um, more games just because of having face value are gonna be bought. And then they are gonna be recognized as a great thing and then they're gonna make the game 2.0, um, basically the, f the consolidation of the blockbuster. Uh, so this is more a tangent that I, really, uh, I, I would like to work on, is uh, the influencers or the critics' opinions dynamics in a, in a platform. Like, I, I, the, the games that I showed you, most of them have uh, a critic score and a user score, and you can see that there is a, like a noticeable difference. Critics are, are more correlated with the actual sales of the game. So you can see there, so I'm gonna go that way, is that, uh, so this is the, the 0.35, uh, almost linear, uh, when sales, these are exponential beans, so 0.2 million, 0.4, uh, having uh, 25 million here. Um, so as sales go up, the score of critics goes up too, and the uh, um, standard deviations go with it. But uh, when uh, consu consumers, although they go up, there is a slight tendency, they don't go all the way up. Actually, they go down in the last two uh, for the, those mega hits. So one thing is that communities could be divided here. That's why also the standard deviation spreads out. And so when a game is like highly um, noticed or bought, it a, became a blockbuster, many people could uh, say that it's bad game or they don't like it or whatever uh, but it also uh, it's important to consider how the difference between the critics and the and the users so is it is known that critics are like bought to, to so while the correlation between the marketing budget and people saying that the <laughs> the game is good is probably pretty high um, in, in, instead of doing it this way, uh, yeah. uh, what I would, it would seem like to me would be more revealing in this to be just like, like um, uh, what if you just said this is a multiple regression where I want to say I want to predict global sales uh -huh. as a function of the critic score and the user score. Yeah. So that, and then and then you could get an R squared out of it. You could also see yeah. you know, how accurately you could. Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, this is like a, a basic description, but yeah. uh, the nature of so. So it's interesting about how you could um, get, get a, uh, address the nature of these dynamics within the model. Mm -hmm. So you can get uh, another actor that is this in influencer, right, that could be paid or not paid. The critic, yeah. Yeah, the critic. And then see how it spreads information if it actually affects or, or does not affect. Actually, all of these graphs will be, will be amenable to some classification method. Yeah. Like, uh, <coughs> paid or unpaid critic, or for example, and that one over there, because it looks like your error terms are not, mm -hmm. your error terms are not going to be super Gaussian. Mm -hmm. there, right? mm -hmm. There's some skewness there. Mm -hmm. That might actually be interesting to look at the correlation uh, for scores, you know, above 50 versus below 50. Yeah. So like a logistic regression on, on both of these w w would would shed more light. Uh, I don't know. But yeah. But it looks cool. I think that, you know if you actually either run a category not categorical analysis uh, under or if, you, or if you actually ran a regression. I mean, one of the things 
that people are doing lately, they give you smiles, they're, they're seriously saying, you, you run a regression on the data, and mm -hmm. then you run the regression, you run the same regression on the age-based model output, mm -hmm. and you see if the, re, if the coefficients are comparable or not. Mm -hmm. right, so that's, that's one way to you know, make a comparison. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it would make sense to add some critics. If, 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 in, if in fact, you know, when you run the regression, this shows that they have a significant role in, in determining the sales. Yeah. Yeah. So you said your agents, the consumers, are in a fully connected network? Uh, yeah. I mean, they're not fully connected between everybody, but the network is fully connected, yes. Maybe a small network or yeah. something like that? I mean, maybe before uh, online gaming, there was uh, smaller communities. Yes. But after yeah. online gaming, you know, there's more connectedness. And there's more connectedness. Yeah. Yeah, you can even argue that the, the speed of adoption and the creation of blockbusters could be correlated with the amount of like internet access. In the sense that it enhances the communication between the community and the information spreads faster and you can generate information cascades with a positive or negative about a game. And and yep, that's it. I mean, this is just uh, the same thing. That there is a lot of data on digital, and it would make sense to like to address. It's a different monster, but I think uh, it is like I mean, the model already has a lot of features that can be modified to easily represent the digital platforms. There are, I would I would guess that there are. Uh, Types of consumers that are more influenced by networked uh, games mm -hmm. versus uh, another type of consumer that plays a game that yeah. his friends do not have to have the same game. There is influence there, yeah. uh, but it, it is uh, less of an influence on that agent type. So yeah, yeah. I actually, yeah, yeah. I consider that a really important feature of games today, like the social aspect. Uh, as a necessity to play, like a, a team plays. Uh, I didn't address that. I mean, this these are just games that you play alone. But yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, it is like n known in the industry, or you can see the pattern that today, if you are going to have a massive game, like if you want to create a blockbuster in the digital platforms, it has to be multiplayer. Yeah, but it, but it, it, isn't even more so. I mean, isn't really. Uh, must, or is, isn't kind of the, the the genius of Pokemon Go was. Uh -huh. It's not that there's an exogenous social network out there, that which people are going to interact with. But basically, the the game makers mm -hmm. cause people to interact. You, know, you meet in the you know in the field where yeah. there's a dinosaur or whatever it is, right? And, yeah. and then yeah. all of a sudden now you have a new That's buddy, right. and uh, so they're actually in that sense designing the social net the network. People are gonna. Yeah, yeah. I have a friend that's like very hardcore player. <laughs> Pokemon Go, and they have these communities in WhatsApp, Telegram, Facebook, and there are also developers getting like software to aid in the search right. of the Pokemon. Um, yeah. Is there a trend uh, for games to be less network? Uh, like for example, I've noticed, uh, you know, as of late, more games are shared. On the online platforms yeah. are shared. Uh, between all of the platforms, like for example, Rocket League and that. Uh huh. Yeah. Type of game. Is it a trend for developer uh, for uh, platforms to be uh, less segregated between the users? So th I think they are losing power. They are losing the ne negotiation power of making exclusives, uh, as deve developers can make easily for different platforms, and the platform will benefit. Mm -hmm. I mean. If if there are three platforms and two say yes, then the third one will lose if they doesn't if they say doesn't okay, it's fine. Yeah. You can release the game for me. So now exclusives are very unique and they usually are first party development like Nintendo or, or say Microsoft. Microsoft releases like a new exclusive called Sea of Thieves. Uh, it's mm, a yeah, pi yeah. pirates game. Uh, it was a flop. But I mean, they're still gonna make money because they hype people. <laughs> and um, but uh, they won't make as money as I guess they were expecting to. 
and they did it as an exclusive and they did it internally so they get people inside and they do, did it as Microsoft and they have uh, developer uh, studios and, st and stuff but they are all under supervision of uh, Microsoft um, but I think that if you don't have like a like a really good investment on a, on a real really critical game that you think is gonna be good the trend is that you'll have your game in all platforms uh, speaking of the social network uh, thing in, in terms of causing games, so there's been a movement that hasn't been successful yet in doing this that uh, wants to allow us all to take our uh, personalities and characters and currencies from one multiplayer game to mm -hmm. another. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was an anime about it a couple uh -huh. years ago called Sword Art Online oh, yeah, where yeah, the yeah. developer created like this world uh, and, and that was pretty much what you could do is you can take your entire profile and personality and go from yeah. Age of Empires or whatever to you know, you know Warcraft Online. Yeah. And yes, the character then would be the same, but then the name would be the same. You can take your money with you, things like that. Hmm. And uh, in addition to having the platforms compete for the publishers, which oh. essentially in, in many ways they are right now. Uh, imagine if the platforms also had to compete for the customers, because right. the customers can go from a game on the PlayStation take all the stuff that they've accumulated in that game mm -hmm. over to the PC and, and then, then onto Nintendo because no longer do you need to have to switch from just one platform to another you can switch from one platform one game one publisher to another platform yeah, yeah, one yeah. game to publisher and not lose any of that, yeah. that, you know, you know, work that, that you destroys the whole, the whole fun learning process of coming into a new game and starting out as a noob and working your way up you come in you're a super wizard in one place, highest level, and you just step over another game, and now you're the biggest pirate there. I mean, that's going to be fun for a few people, but for yeah. most people, it's like you've you actually destroyed the fun. It, it's, it's, that's true, but you always have the option to not sure. take your stuff with you, but sure. I, I think a lot of people might be interested in, in, in taking their currency so that when you enter the game, it's still not as hard as it is. It is the case where the, the first few levels always suck, right? Because you're always, you're always getting beat up all the time and you, you, you don't have enough money. And you can't Sounds like you're anything. wandering out of your area. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, the economic thing, I don't think it will work because some games have a higher uh, yeah. drop rate, so uh -huh. money and stuff Do like that. Do we have an exchange rate? Exchange rate. Yeah. Have an exchange rate. Yeah. 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 So there'll be online <laughs> banks then to handle <laughs> online <laughs> that, that, That's right, and maybe maybe in exchange for real money, you can get a better Ooh. exchange. I mean, really, Bitcoin is 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 one of the things that is allowing uh, most of these ideas to develop because it is a virtual currency more amenable to right. in-game trading than anything else. It right? used to be anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's thank Andrew for the presentation. Thank you. And I think it's very amenable to having suggestions because he's hopefully will.